My guest today was born in Venita, Oklahoma. In 1949, his family moved to Charleston, Illinois. It was there he developed a passion for history and politics, running for a series of offices in whatever school he attended. Many years later, he was elected to the Illinois House. He was picked by Governor Jim Thompson to be his legislative liaison, and he served 10 years as Secretary of State. In 1990, he ran for governor of the state of Illinois and served two consecutive terms. I'm very pleased to welcome former Illinois Governor Jim Edgar. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Being here. You have said that if you had been born in a big city or if you had born in a town, been born in a town that didn't have a university, you think you never would have been governor. Well, I think so. I mean, of course, any change, you know, in your background might affect mm -hmm. the final outcome, but I always thought I had the best of both worlds. Growing up in a small town like Charleston, which was about 10,000 people when I grew up, but having a university there, it, you had a balance. Uh, you knew everybody in town. You could ride your bicycle any place. Uh, you didn't worry about locking your doors. Uh, everybody was kind of an extended family. But then you also had the exposure to a lot of uh, other thinkings than just a small town's mm -hmm. thinking uh, at the university. And I attended the lab school for part of my uh, lower education and uh, so you know I spent a lot of time on the campus as a young person before I ever got to be in college uh, listening to lectures and being exposed to things that I wouldn't be exposed to otherwise but still I had that uh, what I think is a great way to grow up in that small town atmosphere where mm -hmm. you know everybody and it's safe and uh, there's a there's a bond uh, now I had family nearby we even though I was born in Oklahoma, my parents were from Coles County originally, and so we had a lot of relatives around there. And all that, I think, uh, there's no yeah. doubt that that shaped me, good or bad. It shaped me, and hopefully, it was for the good. Yeah. So you were, as I mentioned, you were born in Oklahoma when you were just uh, three, th three, three, three years old. Family moved back to, to Charleston. When you were seven, your dad you lost your dad. He was killed in a, a car accident. And so you were essentially raised by your mom. Right. That in that time, I would think. That it was unusual. Was it was very unusual to have a a, a single parent and have a, a woman raising her family. I mean, that you know, divorce didn't occur. You didn't have that uh, happen very often. But uh, again, in fact, I can remember my teacher had uh, my older brother over one time to talk to him because he had not had many students that did not have a father, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, you know. I always said that my attitude probably on women issues is shaped because I was raised by my mother. Uh, she was a saint. I mean, she uh, did everything for the three boys. She had three sons, and uh, she worked her tail off, but she never missed a ball game. I mean, anything we were doing, mother was there yeah. and was very proud of us. And, uh, and I felt very fortunate that I had her uh, to raise me because I'm sure uh, my sense of right and wrong was strongly influenced by my mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, one of the things I was really struck by when I went back and, and tried again to review you and your record and so forth is that you were, and I gather still probably are, pro-choice, mm -hmm. but that you also had been a supporter of the ERA. Mm -hmm. Was that, d does that, go, again, go back to your somehow well, I, I your didn't get it from, my mother was not political. I mean, my mother used to worry that when I wanted to be in politics that maybe she had dropped me as a baby <laughs> on my head. She couldn't understand <laughs> Finally, after I got elected governor, she told me she thought I did, I did all right. But uh, I think I just, uh, I have a great deal of respect for my mother and what she had to go through. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. you know, she did not have a college degree. Uh, we had very little life insurance. My father was killed. And uh, she, she had to work hard to, to try to make sure we all had what we felt was we wanted. And she was, she was very good at doing whatever probably too good. Most, yeah. my wife will tell you that I, my mother spoiled me. I was the youngest. I was the baby. So, you know, my brothers will tell you the same thing, that I was spoiled. And, uh, but she, uh, she worked hard and I think I've always appreciated what she had to go through and uh, I've had maybe a little more sensitivity on women issues than maybe the mm -hmm. average Republican male. Uh, but I also think uh, from my mother, I, I enjoy uh, talking to women. I enjoy their points of view. I, I have a great deal of uh, respect. Uh, and it carried over not only on some of these issues, but we had more women uh, heading up cabinet posts when I was governor than ever in the history mm -hmm. of the state. Uh, 
had the first woman to head up the Bureau of the Budget, which I think next to being the governor is the most important job in Springfield. So I guess I learned early on that uh, women know what they're doing. You can trust them. Uh, you started to become interested in politics, I gather, when you were really, really young. In fact, I, I think I read that you were the first, uh, you were first elected to office when you were in the second grade. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, s seriously though, this interest in politics goes back to childhood. Where did that come from? Nobody in my family knows because my family was not political. They were, if anything, well, I'll tell the story. When I first got really interested was in first grade. Uh, in the fall, I just had gone that started first grade and they had an election. It was 1952 and uh, General Eisenhower's run against Governor Stevenson. And I remember uh, during the noon hour, some of the upperclassmen, the third graders came to me and said, when they ask, say, you're for Eisenhower. Well, any red-blooded six-year-old boy in 1952 would be for it the Army General. Right. I had a yeah, picture yeah. of Douglas MacArthur on my wall at home. You know, I, this is the Korean War was going, and I didn't have a clue what a governor was. Uh, it didn't mean anything to me, so I told my fellow classmates, I said, when they asked, say Eisenhower. Well, I was so excited, Eisenhower won the election. I ran home, told my parents, that's when I found out they were Democrats. <laughs> uh, not strong Democrats, but they were Democrats. But from that point forward, in my family, I was always known as the Republican, because most of my relatives were Democrats. It, it's a carryover from the Depression. And uh, then in second grade, I, I ran for my first office. Uh, yeah. the, the story on that was uh, we had what they called Red Cross representatives back then. And these were, we'd bring packages to school for Red Cross, they'd send them overseas. And so the teacher uh, had the students elect a boy and a girl to be the Red Cross representative. And, they would help her do the final package. Well, the boy that got elected, I was gone the day they had the election. Uh, the boy that got elected moved out of town. And the girl that got elected was my girlfriend. We were very advanced in Charleston. We had girlfriends in first and second grades. I mean, it was a very social community. And my girlfriend, Mary, was elected Red Cross representative. Well, there was a vacancy. So they said, well, let's, let's vote in Jim. That's Mary's boyfriend. So my first victory was on the coattail of a woman. And Important that's probably, political connection. Yeah, that's there. probably yeah, why I've always had that, <laughs> you know, appreciation on women issues. But uh, and as Red Cross representative, all we did, we went uptown with the teacher, I remember, uh, and we, we got some more things for the packages. And we got done. She bought us both an ice cream cone. And right then I knew I liked <laughs> politics. Well, jumping ahead a, a bit here to your, to your, your experience when you were just finishing up in, in college, right. when you went to, to Eastern. And the background being this lifelong interest in, in being involved in politics. I know you have said that there are a few things that have happened to you that you think were very important breaks that set you on, on the way to eventually be, being governor. And one was that when you finished college, you got this uh, legislative scholarship to, uh, to go to... Legislative internship. It, uh, pardon me, yes, yeah. le uh, legislative internship to go to work for the, the Senate uh, Democrats. Republicans. And uh, it's all right. Yes. Democrats, where did that come from? Yeah. For the for Repub for Senate Republicans. And that you went to work for a guy named Russell Arrington. Now, people who follow, have studied Illinois politics, they will know this name as being someone who is one of the most famous, well-known, important, significant legislators, probably in the post-war era. For those people who don't know any, anything about Russ Arrington, tell us about him. Well, it, it was W. Russell Arrington was his official, his, his first name was William. He never went by that. It was always W. Russell. And uh, he was, he was, Mike Madigan is the Russ Arrington of today. I, I never want to say that Arrington was the Mike Madigan because Arrington came first. <laughs> he was the father of the modern legislator. And he uh, made the, the legislature to be an equal branch with the, uh, the, the, the executive branch. And he was from Evanston. Though he originally had grown up in downstate Illinois, he had been born in Macoupin County, and then had grown up uh, in East St. Louis, attended University of Illinois, uh, and then went to Chicago after he got out of law school, went to Chicago and was a lawyer, a uh, very successful attorney in business, uh, was the wealthiest man in the legislature based off what he had earned outside of being in politics. and. Uh, he was kind of a maverick when he, I mean, he, he, he was a uh, Republican, uh, conservative, but somewhat independent. I mean, he wasn't part of the guys. And uh, late in his career, in fact, he was, I think, almost uh, as old as 
Winston Churchill was when he became prime minister. I think he was 65 or older. Uh, the Young Turks wanted to throw out the old guard, and so they went to Arrington and asked him to become this, the leader. And he agreed, and he was elected. And he completely turned the legislature around. This was in 1965. And when I went to work for him in 1968, he was next to Mayor Daley, probably the most uh, powerful politician in the state. In fact, Mayor Daley used to refer to him as Arrogant Arrington. Uh, he was a rather short gentleman, uh, very uh, self-confident, uh, He uh, and he did not suffer fools well, which I found out as an intern, uh, mm -hmm. and went to work for him. I was scared of him. I'm still scared. He's passed away 20 <laughs> years ago, and I became governor, but he was... Uh, you know, you, you wanted to be giving the right answer. You wanted to make sure everything was right because he would catch a mistake. W were there things that, that you, about how, things that you learned about how the legislature works from just Well, from I think more him? importantly, watching him, I learned what government should be about. It's not about winning the next election. In fact, Arrington had a hard time knowing just what his legislative district was. Uh, he had Glenview Naval Air Base. He'd had it for years. He didn't know that. I mean, he didn't worry about that because he came from a district where once you, you got the nomination as a Republican, you were pretty much guaranteed. But mm -hmm. his focus were on trying to solve problems. And uh, I've, I've told the story many times. The, the most important lesson I learned from Senator Arrington was uh, it was uh, one session he was trying to pass. Uh, the Governor Ogilvie had asked him to, to get an increase in the gasoline tax to help the Chicago Transit Authority, which was not popular at all with the, in the rest of the state. And he tried and tried, and his, most of his senators from the suburbs of downstate, they didn't want to take their money and give it to Chicago for the mass transportation. And finally, it just wasn't going to happen, and he had to call, tell the governor, we can't get it done. And the next morning, he was just very upset. And I went to him, and I said, Senator, if you're upset about last night, you realize the best thing you could have done is let that go down, because if you'd have kept pushing your members, you might have had a political revolt, and they might have thrown you out as leader. He looked at me and he very sternly said, Jim, you don't understand. We're not here for politics. We're here to solve problems, and we did not solve the problem last night. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I thought government was all about after that. And uh, I think there's been times when we have solved problems. Unfortunately, I think in recent times we haven't solved the problems. Yeah. But that's what I learned from Senator Arrington, that you're here, you're here not to get reelected. Now, it's nice to get reelected but you're here to do something and to solve problems. Yeah. So it was after having done this for a couple of years that you then for the first time ran for the state house? Well, Senator Arrington suffered a stroke and was incapacitated and it was obvious he wasn't gonna come back to the legislature. And then there was a new speaker in the house named Bob Blair and he offered me the job to be his chief of staff. And I took that and went mm -hmm. over and worked for him for a couple of years. Then a vacancy occurred in my district back in Charleston. Uh, and I always wanted to run. I mean, I. I, from first grade on, I wanted to be the person elected. I didn't want to necessarily be the, the power behind the throne. I wanted to be on the throne, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, so this chance came up to run back in Charleston, and uh, that's, that happened in 1974. And uh, you, uh, I, I, it's interesting, one of the things that, that you said about that, because the, the first time you ran, you were, were not successful, and you said losing taught you more about people in politics than anything had before. Well, just running taught me, because I had never really run. I'd run uh, for student council president in Charleston High and student body president at Eastern, which all actually helped, because that got people used to me and know me. And, yeah. But running for elected office, uh, particularly in a partisan election, and having to go through a primary and all, uh, that is where the, the the tire, you know, the rubber hits the road kind of thing. And I, I learned a lot. But losing, when you lose, you I think you learn more than you do winning because you realize you can lose. I said there's two important things. That one, I can lose, and two, I never want to lose again. Yeah. But you, you realize you got to work just 28 hours a day, eight days a week. Uh, you, you just don't want to leave anything to chance. And uh, that undoubtedly impacted me as much. And I also said that if I'd have won that election that time, there's a good chance probably about four years later I'd have gone off to Congress and may have never been heard of again. Uh, because, you know, being a congressman from Illinois doesn't often lead to a statewide, it, occasionally it does, but not all that often. And uh, by losing, uh, you know, I hopefully it humbled me a little bit, which mm -hmm. I probably needed it. At 26, I was, you know, pretty cocky. I'd moved up to chief of staff of the speaker, was making a lot of money for those days. And uh, 
thought I kind of knew it all. And uh, to get beat by someone who didn't have a college degree, who had never spent much time in Springfield, uh, I think it, it made you realize you, you need to know how to deal with people. Yeah. It's not just enough to have a fancy title. And so that was a humbling experience, but it was a good experience. And uh, I think probably better prepared me uh, to, for the journey that was ahead of me and uh, to get a chance to finally get to be governor, which yeah. was really my goal at that point. So when, uh, when people talk about your achievements of what happened during the time you were governor, probably, and particularly if you're only getting a thumbnail sketch, probably the big thing people will point to is the fact that when you took office, the state had a huge deficit, and when you left, there was a surplus. Now, if we get, I, I guess I, I want to acknowledge that, but then also say, well, beside that, what do you think were the most important things you, that you achieved? Well, one thing, we dealt with the greatest natural disaster the state ever faced, and that was the big flood in 93. And mm -hmm. I think most people felt like the state handled that well. Uh, and uh, that was a priority, and that's not something we ever talked about in a campaign. And uh, So I think we dealt with natural disasters, which is one of the responsibilities of a governor, not the president, contrary to poor G President Bush got beat up, what happened in New Orleans, that was really the governor's responsibility. Uh, another area that I, I think one of the areas people say, what are you the proudest of? And I said, well, there's an area that the press very seldom ever mentioned. When I became governor, Illinois was last of the 50 states in the number of adoptions. When I left office, we were number one. And that was a major project Brenda undertook, and we pushed through changes in the laws to make it easier to adopt children. Uh, and I've always felt like what we've done, we did for children, not only in adoption, but some other areas, revamp children and family services, and the attitude about uh, the child welfare should come first, not the family. Uh, I think a lot of those things, to me, are the most important, and they're still in, in place. Uh, we reorganized higher education, the governance of higher education in this state, uh, which uh, I think works good when you have a governor who will name the right people to the board. Uh, we, uh, natural resources, uh, we, we purchased and brought in more land in, for conservation purposes than any in the history of the state. And we did that when we really didn't have any money. I mean, we had to do some pretty creative financing. But uh, So there's a whole host of things we did that were not partisan. There weren't battles with Chicago that uh, I think a lot of times got overlooked. But to mm. me, they were as important as dealing with the budget, uh, you know, we expanded McCormick Place as the largest public works project in the history of the Midwest, uh, which, in McCormick Place is a big engine of, of uh, jobs in the state. Uh, so, you know, I think we got a lot done in that. But the most important thing probably was when I left office, public opinion polls showed that people had a very high regard toward Illinois state government. Mm -hmm. They thought it worked. And to me, that you know, being someone who's run for office, you always wonder what the public thinks. And to me, that was an indication that we had done a good job. We had turned those numbers around from where they were when I came in the office. And uh, that, I think, is probably to me is the best indicator that we did some good things. One thing that, that I know that you talked about then, and I, and I think that you still think you would like to see happen, uh, is uh, a change in the way that schools are funded and move away from schools relying on the property tax, which creates this big disparity between rich districts and poor ones, uh, and to move from there to an income tax. It, you, you, you still think that that'd be a no, good I idea? No, I still think that's the right approach. Uh, you know, we tried some things we didn't accomplish. That was one of them. But what people forget, while we didn't get the, the switch, we did get the money. We got other taxes raised that raised as much money as we were going to raise in the income tax. We just didn't get the property tax reform that we'd like to got. Yeah. Uh, and we did create the minimal foundation level for schools. And that, right. that was an important step in trying to help the poorer school districts, which are predominantly downstate, uh, to have enough money. They're never going to have as much as a new Trier or some of the other North Shore school districts, but enough to, to provide a quality education. Uh, but we didn't get the tax reform, and I mm. think uh, there still is need to take a look at that. I think the whole tax structure in Illinois is, is it's not adequate to deal with the 21st century. Uh, I think they need to look at broadening the sales tax and a whole host of things. But uh, I've also learned that uh, 
you know, you, you can't get everything. You've got to prioritize. You have to uh, uh, take what you can get. And, uh, but you, you need to try. I mean, you're not going to get 100%. If you get 100%, you probably didn't try hard enough. I want to ask you about something else that's a little different, that's a little bit more personal. Um, in 1994, you underwent emergency quadruple heart bypass right. surgery and had had, had, I think you had had an angioplasty before that, yeah. and then a couple of years later, you uh, were hospitalized when you had, you were exercising, had some, some chest mm -hmm. pain. All of that, concerns about your health, and I hope you're well, uh, how did that shape what you thought you might want to do? Oh, it had a huge impact. I mean, you know, here I was, uh, when I first had the first uh, incident, I was 46 years old. Well, when you're 46 years old, you don't think about dying. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you think you're kind of immortal. You're going to live forever. And that began to make me think, well, then when I had the bypass and I was 48, that was during a re-election, right in the middle of the campaign. I remember sitting in the hospital room thinking, you know, I like being governor and I want to get re-elected, but there's other things in life I want to do too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I may not live forever. Now, I'm going to live longer. I'm not going to die tomorrow. I mean, the doctor says, you know, you could you're gonna, you'll be, you know, you should have a normal life, but you do realize that you only have so many years, and there's a lot of things I wanted to do, and so fast forward to, do I run for a third term, or do I run for the U.S. Senate, or much to the surprise of anybody, I was even thinking, I'm just going to get out of politics. Uh, that had a lot to do with my uh, thinking about what am I going to do in the future, because uh, I had grandkids coming online, and mm -hmm. I wanted to spend some time with them. I like to hike, I like to travel. I don't necessarily want to wear a coat and tie when I travel <laughs> overseas and have to be able to yeah. pronounce names I can't pronounce when I'm making speeches. Uh, so all that entered into, and there's no doubt that yeah. was a, uh, I won't say it was a game changer, but it was a huge yeah. impact on how I viewed life and well, it's, still it, view life. Well, in, uh, in 2003, when uh, Peter Fitzgerald, Senator mm -hmm. Fitzgerald, said that he would not be running for re-election, there were a lot of people who thought, uh, that you would make a very strong candidate for Senate and would like to see you run. And it seemed that at some point, maybe you were thinking about it, and then finally you, you decided against it. In fact, what you said was that you were giving your wife an early Mother's Day gift, mm -hmm. which made everybody wonder, well, did Brenda no, say you, and I, Brenda gets I really... Is, yeah, Brenda, Brenda gets beat up on this. And more importantly, two years later for governor. Now that, I got to tell you, between U.S. and Senate and governor, governor is the important office in Illinois. And uh, I did think about it because the president wanted me to think about it, called me, and, you know, I thought about it, the Senate, but I I really didn't think that was what I wanted to do, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought we could, you know, get by without me in the Senate. Uh, I, I get calls to this day, people blaming me for President Obama, because they said, well, if you'd have run for the Senate, Barack Obama would never he be. Would never was, been, uh, but I said, after he made that speech at the convention, I'm not yeah. sure I could have beat him, but two years later, when the governor's race came up, uh, that, I, that I, very seriously, I really... I kind of had a mental list of things they'd have to do for me to get me back in, and they met all of them. And I, I'm still surprised to this day that I didn't run. In some well, way. it seems like say again here, here people would like to see you run against Rod Blagojevich, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure again people thought you would have made a, a strong candidate. And it seemed that at the time you're, it seemed for you, deciding not to was a very difficult, oh, very emotional it was. decision. That was one you you said. And, and I think there was a very emotional press conference where you yeah. said, guys, my, my political career is done. When I announced in 1997 uh, I wasn't going to run in 98, uh, that was a tough decision to, to step down. It's all, I think it's tough for anyone that has power, be it in government or the private sector or whatever. It's something you work for all your life to voluntarily step aside. And at somewhat of an early age. I mean, I was 52, and I now look back, I was really young at 52. But... Uh, that's a difficult thing to do, but in uh, 2000, for the 2006 elections, actually in 2005, when I did had the press conference that I would not be a candidate, that's the first time I'd ever said, I will never be a candidate. In, t in 97, I left a little wiggling room. I just yeah. said, I'm not going to be a candidate this election. I didn't rule out the possibility that maybe someday things would change and I'd come back. But uh, in 2005, I, I realized I need to it's either now or never, and yeah. you know I made that call. But uh, the governor, the, the governor race, more importantly, the serving as governor is something that I very much enjoyed doing, 
and uh, I think it's very important. And it was the one thing that could have probably got me back into uh, elected office. Uh, but uh, when I came down to it, I realized I really, you know, I had a I had a good run. Things were good when I left. Uh, you know, there's other people I'm sure that can come along and solve these problems. When you start thinking you're the only one, you have a problem. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I just. From a personal point of view, I just didn't make a lot of sense. It wasn't Brenda. Now, Brenda left it up to me. Now, I have to say I know what Brenda's thoughts were on it. I, I'm sure. But uh, she, she always said, if you want to run, I'll, I'll be supportive. She said, I, I might vote absentee from Colorado where the kids are, but, uh, you know, I, I'll be supportive. So in the end, it was my decision. It's, yeah. it's, people shouldn't blame Brenda for those decisions. Just, just one, yeah. one further thing uh, about the state of Illinois. The state continues, all the things may be a little bit better, the state continues to struggle, uh, and uh, the big problem is what are we going to do with the pension system, which, of course, affects both mm -hmm. of us. Uh, are, you, um, are you optimistic about the, the future of the state, and what do you think it's going to take to turn it around? I'm optimistic about the future of the state because it's a great state. We've got great resources. We have both natural and you know, like universities and industries and all. We, the people, the ethnic diversity we have in this country, state is, I think, makes this a very outstanding state. Uh, I think our political leadership has not been up to the job the last few years. We need to change that. And I think the public has got to be involved in that. I, the, we've got elections coming up next year. We're going to have the governors up, uh, legislatures up. People need to pay attention. And they, they don't, they got to be careful not to be taken in by some of the demagoguery that we see and we're going to see in this next election. Uh, there are no real easy solutions out there. It's going to take people who understand how they can work together and be able to compromise and be able to, uh, uh, you know, slowly get this state back in shape. Uh, I don't think it's getting worse, but I'm, I, I don't think it's getting a lot better. And mm -hmm. if we don't get better, then we get worse because it's, the longer this goes on, the more the state uh, deteriorates so uh, I'm I guess I'm, I'm still a little pessimistic but knowing what resources this state have I, I try to be optimistic and uh, we have an opportunity uh, in next year to to try to put a new team in place in Springfield that uh, can try to solve these problems but I, I would just caution everyone it's not going to be easy and if anybody comes along and they've got some easy solutions uh, be very suspicious and if they uh, going to do this all by lowering your taxes and getting rid of all the crooks. Uh, that alone, that ain't going to do it. Uh, it it's it's going to have to be Republicans and Democrats, downstaters, Chicago, and sitting down and compromising and doing something we just haven't been good at doing the last decade. We used to do it in Illinois. Uh, we did it every year when I was there, and I did it before when I was a legislator and staffer. I mean, I used to see at the end of session, Everybody would kind of sit down and come together. Maybe people didn't always like the, the solutions, but th they worked, and the state uh, moved along. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's going to take time. This isn't going to happen overnight either. Yeah, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Governor, very Thank much you. for talking with us. And to you all, thanks very much for watching. I hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.